in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. In Mark, chapter 5, in verse 21, the Bible says this. When Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and so he stayed by the seashore. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. It took a little over three decades for me to finally experience it. I mean, I, I had seen a lot of people go through it. I had cried with many people. I had grieved with many people. I had been to many visitations. And as a preacher, even performed many funerals. I had seen so many people go through this over and over again, but never had I gone through it myself. Never had I felt that kind of pain. Never had I felt that kind of grief and sorrow in my heart. Never had I felt those emotions. You see, back in November of 2014, for the very first time in my life, someone close to me died. For the first time in my life, someone close to me actually exited out of this life, and this traumatic experience for me actually all began with a phone call about six months earlier. You see, back in May of 2014, my grandmother, who raised me from the time I was a little baby in Nacogdoches, Texas. She called me, and she told me that my 49-year-old uncle, who was essentially my brother, because we were raised by the same people, she said that he had just got off the phone with her, and he reported that he, after going through some tests, it was revealed that he had cancer. In fact, it was revealed that he had stage four stomach cancer. And brothers and sisters, I don't know how much you know about stomach cancer. But let me tell you something. Typically, 90% of the people who get diagnosed with stage four stomach cancer, they die within six months. Their outlook doesn't look very good. But you see, since he was a family man, since he had three children, he was determined to fight it. He was determined to battle and extend his life as long as he could. In fact, he immediately started chemo treatments at MD Anderson in Houston, Texas. He was under the care of some of the best doctors in the world. And I got to tell you, at first, things looked very promising. I mean, after the first few rounds of, of, of chemo treatments, that tumor started shrinking. And he started feeling a lot better, and he started eating more. And we just knew that we were going to have a few more years with him on this earth. We just knew that, right, Janice? We knew that. We thought that. But after a couple of months, the cancer started getting more aggressive. In fact, it got so aggressive that after four months, it started taking a huge toll on his body. And it killed him. He died only six months after being diagnosed. And as I said earlier, that was the first time in my life that I experienced somebody close to me dying. This man who was like my brother, this man who was one of the few father figures I had in my life, and I really want to emphasize that because let me tell you something about me. I have never seen my father a day in my life. I could walk by him on the street and not even know that's my father. And so this man was one of the few father figures I had. And I had to watch him suffer at 49 years old until he eventually died. There was nothing I could do to save him. 
And so let me just ask you, have you ever experienced that before? I mean, have you ever felt helpless in trying to save somebody that you love? Have you ever wished you, you had the power to keep somebody you love from dying? You ever felt that before? I'm willing to guess that for many of the wonderful people in this room, you felt that before. You understand what that feels like. And if you can understand what that feels like, then my friends, you can also understand what this man felt like here in Mark chapter 5. Going back to Mark chapter 5, I want you to notice carefully how there in that text, we're introduced to a man named Jairus. Who was Jairus? Well, according to what the scripture says, Jairus was a, was a man of influence. He was a ruler of the synagogue, and he had heard about our Lord. He had heard about Jesus. He had heard about the power of Jesus. In fact, when Mark introduces us to him in the text, we find him coming to Jesus and humbling himself before him and, and begging for his help. The Lord had just come back from a boat trip across the Sea of Galilee where he performed a miracle. And as soon as he returns from his trip, the scripture says, that Jairus comes and he falls down before him and he begs for his help. Specifically, he begs for him to come to his home and save his daughter. You see, unfortunately, Jairus had a very sick daughter. In fact, she was so sick that the scripture also says she was dying. She was terminal. She was literally on her deathbed, and her father had faith that the only person who could save her, the only person who could keep her in this world was the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so let's go back to the text, and let's let the Holy Spirit tell us the rest of the story. I can't say any better than the Holy Spirit. So in Mark chapter 5, we start with verse 24, and here in the context we find Jairus coming up to to, to Jesus, and he humbles himself before him, and he says, please, just come lay hands on my daughter, and, and she'll live. I have faith in that. And so in verse 24, the scripture says, and he, referring to Jesus, went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and, and pressing in on him. A, a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians, and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she thought, if I just touch his garments, I'll get well. There is faith again. You see that? Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving himself, that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And the disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman who, who had done, but the woman rather fearing, trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue officials saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official when he saw a commotion and the people, loud, the people loudly weeping and wailing. And entering in, he said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. They began laughing at him. But putting them all out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions, and he entered the room where the child was. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kun, which translated means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl got up and began to walk. For she was 12 years old, and immediately, maybe by now you noticed, immediately is used a lot in Mark's account. Immediately they were completely astounded. And he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this. And he said that something should be given to her to eat. 
want you to process all of this for a moment or two. Will you do that? I mean, what, what a powerful record found here in the gospel. In fact, let me just ask you, have you ever seen anything like that before in your life? I mean, have you ever seen anything remotely close to that before in your life? You know you haven't. You, you, you know that one of, the, one of the things we all got in common this morning is none of us have ever seen with our eyes this kind of power demonstrated by God. None of us have ever seen with our eyes somebody actually raised from the dead. None of us have ever seen with our eyes somebody come from Hades, somebody return from Hades. None of us have ever seen somebody have their soul reunited with their body. I don't care who you are this morning. I don't care how, how old or young you may be. I don't care where you traveled in the world. You know you've never seen this before. I've never seen it and you've never seen it. And yet one of the things that binds us all together and makes us a family is we still have faith it happened, right? We still have faith that this happened 2,000 years ago in the area of Galilee. The question is, how is this account impacting us how is it impacting how we view Jesus how is it impacting how we view critical aspects of life for example how is it impacting how we view death let me ask you a question do you know what some of the top fears that people have are if you were to go and google that question and don't do that right now later on if you go and google that question you go to the restaurant, you go to the hotel again, and you Google that question. What you're going to find is poll and, and poll after poll, for most people, the top fear they have is public speaking. And then right behind that is death. So you got public speaking, and then you got death. You know what that means? That means that for most people in this country, they rather die. They rather be in the grave than do what I'm doing right now. <laughs> A lot of people have real fears of public speaking. And for other people, they have real fears of death. For the majority of folks in our society, they actually view death as the worst possible thing that could happen to somebody. And the question is, why is that? Why is it that so many people are afraid to die? Well, if you don't mind, let me give you a few suggestions as to why people are afraid of death. First, let me say that for a lot of people, they are afraid of death because death dwells in the realm of the unknown. I mean, think about it. Nobody in this room, nobody on this earth knows legitimately what it's like to die. Nobody in this room, nobody on this earth right now legitimately knows what it feels like, what it's like to have their soul exit out of their bodies. Death dwells in the realm of the unknown for me and you, and for a lot of folks, that scares them. For a lot of folks, that terrifies them, but for other people, they fear death because they view it as the end. In other words, they feel like this life they have right now is all there is, and there's nothing else to come. They say once they die, that's going to be it. They're done. There's nothing else beyond this life we have right now. A lot of people in our society have that view about death, but let's bring this closer to home. Can we do that? Let's talk about people like me and you. Let's talk about religious folks. Brothers and sisters, for people like you and I, religious folks, the reason why many of those folks fear death is because they know they're not living right. They know that they are currently living outside of the will of God, and if they died today, they would be lost. For a lot of people, they fear death because they know they're not prepared for it. They know they're not prepared to meet God. And let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, if that describes any of us in the room right now, well, we're, we are right to fear death. We are right to fear the possibility of dying today if we're not living according to the word of God. Death is the worst thing that could happen to us if we haven't had our sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. That's a fact. But those are just a few views people have of death. But let's contrast that now 
to how the Lord views it. Going back to Mark chapter 5, I want you to notice how the Lord views death. I want you to notice how in contrast to what many people believe about death today, to the Lord, death is not the end. To the Lord, death is not something that we should be afraid of. He is not a, a permanent situation. Instead, he says, it's merely sleep. What does that mean? Well, that essentially means that death is a temporary situation. It is something that doesn't last forever because he has the power to bring people out of it. He has the power to raise the dead. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the main thing we need to take away from this account. Above anything else I could say about this account, I want to emphasize to you this morning that our Lord Jesus is so powerful that not only can he walk on water, not only can he miraculously feed thousands of people, not only can he tell terrible storms to cease, but he can also raise the dead. He can also reach into the realm of Hades and pull out a soul and reunite it with its body. He can also say, arise to a little girl that everybody knows is dead, and she actually does that. She actually gets up. She actually comes back to the land of the living. Jesus, and think about this, Jesus actually raised a dead person. And, and, and remarkably, that's not the only time we find him doing that in the gospel, right? I'm reminded of a great story found in, in Luke chapter 7. Remember in Luke chapter 7, there we can read about a time when Jesus raised a man from the dead at his own funeral. R- remember, it was in the village of Nain that, that Jesus touched the coffin of a young man. And the young man got up and he gave him back to his mother who was, who was a widow. Remember when the people saw that take place, the scripture says that they were gripped with fear and they said, surely God has visited his people. Jesus raised a man from the dead at his own funeral. And if you think that's powerful, we'll put that what you find in John 11. Because in John chapter 11, there we can read about Jesus raising a man from the dead who was actually buried. Remember in the case of Lazarus, he had been dead for four days. And Jesus went to his tomb and called him out of it, and he came out. In fact, that case of resurrection was so undeniable. That case of resurrection was so verifiable that not even his enemies could deny it. Not even his enemies could deny that he had the power to raise the dead. In fact, instead of trying to foolishly deny the evidence of that power, you know what they did? They tried to get rid of it. Remember in John chapter 12, the scripture says that after Lazarus was raised from the dead, the enemies of Jesus plotted to kill him, and they also plotted to kill Lazarus. Lazarus hadn't been back in the world 24 hours yet, and the enemies of Jesus are plotting to kill him because they know that he is living testimony that Jesus is who he claimed to be. The enemies of Jesus... They refused to believe in him, even though there was no doubt that this man could raise the dead. The question, though, is what about us? What about me? What about you? What are we going to do with this evidence? Uh, I mean, unlike the the enemies of Jesus, are we going to allow this this evidence we read about Jesus being able to raise the dead? Are we going to allow that to impact how we view Jesus? Are we going to allow it to cause us to believe in him as the Lord and submit to him completely? Are we going to allow it to lead us to submitting to his authority? Are we going to allow it to to impact how we view his power over death? I want to show you something in John chapter 11 because I really like what Jesus says. It always touches my heart. When I read what Jesus says to Martha, Shortly before he raised Lazarus, John 11, verse 25, after Martha confessed her belief in the resurrection. In John chapter 11, in verse number 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this, Martha? Do you believe this, brothers and sisters over here? Do you believe this, brothers and sisters over here? Do you believe that Jesus has the power to resurrect? Do you believe that Jesus has the power to give us eternal life, to make it so that even though we exit out of this life, we still can live forever? Do you believe that? Well, my friends, if you believe that, then let me tell you what you won't do. If you really believe in the power of Jesus, then you won't live your life in fear of death. You won't live your life in fear of the inevitable. Instead, you're going to live your life with some confidence. You're going to live your life with some assurance. You're going to live your life with, with faith that death is not the end because Jesus says he has the power to raise you up. He has the power to resurrect you. And in fact, throughout the gospel, he promises to do just that when he comes again. You see, if we die before our Lord comes back like a thief, the Bible makes it very clear in many passages that when Jesus returns, a day of resurrection will take place. The Lord will bring us out. He will bring us out of the grave. He will resurrect our bodies, and we can have confidence in his ability to do that because guess what? He was raised from the dead just like he promised. You see, because we have a king that has power over death and Hades, we don't have to live our lives in fear. We don't have to live our lives in fear of the inevitable. We don't have to live our lives in fear of death. Instead, we can have assurance, we can have confidence, we can have faith that when our Lord comes again, not only will he resurrect us, but he will give us eternal life when, he, when we stand before him in judgment. My right, brothers and sisters, what we find here in Mark 5, it should impact how we view death. But not only should it impact how we view death, secondly, let me say, that we find here in Mark 5, going back there, it should also impact how we view others. You know, it is interesting how in this text we are considering, not only does Jesus perform one miracle, but he actually performed two, right? He actually have two different people, and I don't know if you noticed this or not, but both of these people are totally different from each other. On the one hand, you have Jesus helping Jairus, this man of influence, this man who was respected, this man who was a ruler of the synagogue. And on the other hand, you have, you have him helping this, this woman with this issue of blood. I mean, before he even got to Jairus' home to take care of the business at hand, he first helped this woman who had a medical condition that certainly would have made her viewed as unclean by the Jews in her time. You see, unlike Jairus, this woman that is mentioned here, she had a situation that would have certainly caused her to be viewed as an outcast in our society. It would have certainly caused her to be shunned by many folks. And so you got Jesus helping two people who are really totally different from each other, but brothers and sisters, should that really surprise us? I mean, isn't that exactly what we find the Lord doing all throughout his ministry, all throughout the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Do we not find him giving attention and grace to all different kinds of people? Don't we find that all over the place? You know we do. You know that when we just do a casual read of the gospel, we find our Lord very clearly helping Jews and helping Gentiles. Helping people with leprosy, viewed as unclean. Helping the blind, helping the poor, helping people who were viewed as terrible sinners and outcasts in society. All throughout the gospel, we find Jesus helping so many different kinds of people. And you want to know why he did that? You want to know why he gave attention to so many different kinds of people? Well, brothers and sisters, he did that because... At the end of the day, he viewed every single person as important. He, he did that because he loved every person. And he knew that every person had one important thing in common, and that is they were all sinners who needed the gift of salvation only he had to offer. 
That's the mentality Jesus carried with him all the time. The question is, what about us? What about me? What about you? I mean, how do we view other people? How do we view the people in the world? What is our current perception of the folks who are not in this room with us right now? For example, how do we view our coworker who may be living with or shacking up with their boyfriend or girlfriend? How do we view the people around us who practice homosexuality? How do we view that next door neighbor or our next door neighbors who may be in an unlawful marriage? How do we view the poor? How do we view those with a criminal background? How do we view those who may be of a different physical race or have a different color of skin? How do we view those who may have a lot of worldly baggage when they come and visit us in our worship assemblies? How do we view these people that we come into contact with every single day? I mean, do we view them like Jesus does? Do we view them as loved and valued by God? Do we view them as people who have eternal souls and one day they're going to die and they're going to live in eternity in either heaven or hell? Do we understand that before anything else, the people we come into contact with every single day, their greatest need is not money. Their greatest need is Jesus. The greatest need is to hear the gospel. The greatest need is to have us teach them the gospel so they can submit to Jesus. What well, I just want you to see is in addition to being touched by the great miracle that is done here, I want to suggest we also need to be touched by the compassion and love of Jesus. We also need to understand that being a follower of Jesus requires that we be willing to give attention to all different kinds of people. It doesn't matter where they currently may be in life. This story should impact how we view death. It should impact how we view others. But then thoroughly, let me say, it should also impact how we view our problems. Go back to the text again. Think carefully about about the problems that the people in this account are dealing with. I mean, these are some serious problems. Th think about the woman that Jesus helped on his way to Jairus' house. Remember in verse number 25, the Bible says that this woman had been suffering for a very long time. She actually had been suffering with this issue of blood for about 12 years. For over a decade, she had been the doctor after doctor after doctor, and she still wouldn't get any better. She still wasn't getting any relief. In fact, she actually was getting worse. This woman had a serious problem. But I don't believe, at least in my opinion, it was as serious as what Jairus and his wife were dealing with. I'm a parent of two beautiful children. There are many parents in this room. And I just want to say that Jairus and his wife are probably going through one of the worst experiences that two people can go through in life. And that is they're watching their only child, as Luke says, suffer. They're watching her go through a miserable existence and be on the verge of death. That's what they're going through. All of these people are suffering terribly in their lives. All of them are going through some terrible problems. But brothers and sisters, no matter how severe and big their problems were, they weren't too big for Jesus, were they? They weren't so great that the Lord could not handle them. The Lord was able to alleviate every problem that these people faced. And so I want to ask you, what about you this morning? What about you? What are you going through in your life right now? What kind of problem are you dealing with? What kind of problem has been going in and out of your mind even as you have been listening to this lecture? You're dealing with a medical problem. You're dealing with a grieving problem. You're dealing with a marriage problem. 
You're dealing with an unfaithful child problem. You're dealing with a financial problem. You're dealing with a somebody bullying you and discouraging you in your job problem. You're dealing with a sin problem. You're dealing with a, someone trying to discourage you problem and bring you down kind of problem. You, are you dealing with that? Is there somebody in this room who's facing some serious problems? If there is, and I want you to know something. I want you to know that no matter what problem or problems you are currently facing, none of them are too big for King Jesus. None of them are so great that the Lord cannot help you and deliver you if you put your faith and trust in him. And someone says, well, wait a minute, Sean, are you saying that Jesus can raise the dead today? Are you saying that, that, he's, that miracles are being performed? No, I'm not saying that. You know I'm not saying that. I understand that the dead are not being raised physically. I understand that the time of miracles has ceased. I get that. But you see, my friends, even though we don't live in a time where the dead are being raised and people are being healed miraculously, we need to understand that the Lord is still in the business of watching over and caring for his people. The Lord is still fully capable of providentially helping his people with any problem they face. That's never going to change as long as this earth continues to stand. And so this story here needs to impact us. It needs to impact how we view death, how we view ourselves, how we view our problems. And then fourthly, it needs to also impact how we view ourselves. Ourselves. Think about us as human beings for just a moment. You know, as human beings, we've been able to accomplish some amazing things, haven't we? I mean, think about it. As human beings, we actually have been able to make shuttles that can launch in outer space. We've actually been able to make shuttles that can take people to, to the moon. I mean, that's so crazy that, I, that I even Steph Curry is willing to accept it, right? We've actually taken people to the moon. We actually have aircrafts that can take folks from one part of the country to the other in a relatively short amount of time. Think about the iPhone, the iPad, and all these other high-tech devices that put worldwide information in the palm of our hands and to our disposal at any time we desire. Think about all the medical advancements. Think about all the treatments that have extended people's lives, maybe even extended some lives of, of folks in the room right now. Think about all the marvelous architectural achievements across the globe. Think about YouTube and Netflix and, and Facebook and, and Skype and, and Twitter. Think about smartwatches. Think about GPSs. Think about how we can actually live stream this lecture right now and people across the world can see it. I mean, again, as human beings, we've been able to accomplish some amazing things. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. No matter how great our accomplishments may be, none of them compare to the power demonstrated by King Jesus. None of them compare to his creative power. None of them compared to his ability to make the sun and the moon and the stars. None of them compared to his ability to make us and give us our intellect. None of them compared to his ability to sustain and hold all things together. None of them compared to his ability to reunite the soul with the body. None of them certainly compared to his ability to cure man's greatest disease, which is the spiritual disease of sin. None of them compared to how through him, sinful people like me and you, we can actually be forgiven. We can actually be reconciled unto God. We can actually be here with the hope of heaven. I mean, as smart and as, as strong as we think we are, the truth of the matter is all of our efforts are feeble when compared to the power of Jesus. That's the truth about life. That's the truth about our Lord Jesus, and that truth about him should humble us. 
That truth about him should lead us to being in awe of him. It should lead us to standing in awe of him. It should lead us to trusting him. It should lead us to understanding that Jesus can do so much more for us than we can do for ourselves. That should lead us to understanding that while the physically dead are not being revived today, Jesus is still in the reviving business. He can still revive a bad marriage. He can still revive bad relationships that exist between brethren. He can still revive broken homes. He can still revive people who are spiritually dead and walking the path of sin. Even in our time today, Jesus is, is still in the business of reviving these kinds of things. But for him to be willing to do that, we have to first be willing to do what Jesus told Jairus to do. And so going back to Mark chapter 5 one more time, after Jesus had healed the woman with this, this terrible medical condition, this issue of blood, the Bible says in Mark 5 and verse 35, while he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue officials saying, your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher anymore? There's nothing that can be done. Jesus can't do anything. Now the girl is dead. But Jesus, in verse 36, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, do not be afraid any longer. Only believe. Notice how, while surrounded by a people who evidently had no faith, Jesus told Jairus that he needed to do two things. Even though he was around all these people who had no faith, he needed to not be afraid, and he needed to have faith. He needed to take courage and believe and trust in the power of Jesus. That's what Jesus told him to do, and my friends, that's what we need to do. No matter what problems we face in our lives, we got to always trust in Jesus. We got to always have courage in Jesus. We got to always have faith that he has the ability and the power to revive any part of our lives. We got to have total confidence in the King of Kings and Lord of Lords because let me tell you something. If we're going to make it to heaven at all, it's going to be through Jesus and only through Jesus. In John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Notice how Jesus says that he's not just a way to heaven. He says, I'm the way to heaven. I'm the way to heaven. I am the full embodiment of truth. I am the one who has the source of eternal life. I am the one that will lead you to heaven with God. Jesus says he is the only one that can bring us in. And my friends, I want to close by saying that we can have absolute confidence in that promise because of stories like this we read in the Gospel of Mark. I appreciate you listening so attentively. God bless you. You're wonderful people. I love you. Even though I've never met you, you're still my brothers in Christ and sisters in Christ. I love you all. Thank you for listening. I hope from anything from this lecture you'll take away, let's trust Jesus and submit to him completely. God bless you all. Thank you.